mean, you know, if we, if we think kind of hierarchically of apostolic calling versus being a disciple. So it's, I, I have a hard time equating myself to a Peter, James, or John, but I don't have a hard time seeing myself as a disciple. So there's actually a conversation between the Lord and disciples, and it's in the New Testament. And I would propose to you that it is a parable given so that we can understand how to interpret the second coming and the signs of the second coming. And that parable is in what we like to call, oh, where is it? The, the road to Emmaus. The scriptures actually call it the walk to Emmaus. And in that, the walk is seven miles. It is between two disciples and Christ, one of whom is named Cleopas. And Cleopas is talking with this other disciple, and they are disturbed because the Savior is dead. Um, And they are now receiving word that his tomb is empty. And so the Lord comes upon them uh, in disguise, I guess you could say. And he sees that they're troubled. And they say, he's, he's like, what's wrong? And Cleopas is like, do you not know what just happened? The Jesus who was supposed to be our Savior has been killed. And he says, we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. And now we've got, this is kind of funny, certain women, you know, like, why does he throw that in there? Like, like the women are saying uh, that he's back. That got funny. So, and, and watch how the Lord responds to him. This is, this is pretty brutal. Oh, fools. And slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. You see what he's saying there? Why, why are you questioning? You should know. And how should they know? They must not have believed the prophets. Because if they had believed and studied the prophets, they would understand what was happening. And, he, and then he begins at Moses and all the prophets and expounds to them all the scriptures concerning himself. Okay, how do we liken that to us? If we go back to the conversation with the Lord outside of the temple between him and his apostles, what shall be the sign of thy second coming? Well, did he give us a hint on the road to Emmaus? What did he say? Begin with Moses and expound all the prophets. So what if there is a tale to be told, starting with Moses, that would expound all things to us about the second coming, such that we should be like Cleopas or not be like Cleopas, and we should be aware of what is going to happen. Now, there's a a little trouble with that because what I typically hear people say is, well, no man can know. And that seems inconsistent with what the Lord is saying. All right, so let's go back to this. He sits down. He says to them, and and you find these consistent... I'm going to pick out pieces from each chapter, but if you actually... You can take all the chapters... And you can put them side by side, and you can see where all the different chapters line up. Like, the question is the same. Jesus departed from the temple. They asked him questions. He goes out of the temple. They ask him questions. He goes out of the temple. They ask him questions. See, that it's starting with the same conversation, but what's happening is by going through all five chapters, you're getting different pieces to get a more comprehensive picture of the second coming. Now remember why why when he is asked what is the sign of thy second coming why would he give this all of these are pulled out of those 3 chapters 
and they are verses relative to what will happen after he dies, but before or by the time Jerusalem is sieged and the temple is destroyed. Why would he give this information? He's giving us a type and shadow of what's to come. Okay, it's a type and a shadow, and he's going to communicate that. So between the time he dies and the temple is thrown down, many will come in his name. They will deceive many. Go not after them. There will be wars, rumors of wars. These things must need be. There will be commotions, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation. There will be earthquakes in diverse places, famines, troubles, fearful sights, great signs in the heavens, and then the desolation of abomination. And when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of, standing where it ought not. What's that mean? What do you mean standing where it ought not? Well, what if we go to Daniel, right? Because he says the thing spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Let's go to Daniel. Watch what Daniel says. From the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up. Okay, what, what does that mean, set up? If something is set up, is it complete? So now we don't just have a desolation of abomination that happens. We have some sort of triggering sign event which is indicative of the desolation coming, and it is the setting up of the desolation. So now let's go back and look at that verse again. When you see the abomination standing where it ought not. What I would propose to you is that's Mark's way of saying when you see it set up. Then do what? Then... Flee to the mountains, let those who are in Jerusalem depart out of it, and let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. Why would that matter to us today? Because all of that happened by 73 AD. <coughs> because the Lord clearly indicates in these chapters that this is a type and a shadow. Now, what you might be inclined to say is, well, no problem for me. I don't live over in the Middle East. I don't have to worry about this. You guys don't either. I live in Utah. You live here in Georgia. No worries. Right? Wrong. Wrong. <laughs> okay. There is a slight problem. I'm going to jump around a little bit. Let's go there. Actually, let's go here. Give me a sec. I'm, I'll, I'm getting there. Okay, we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 2. Okay, notice what's in the chapter heading right here. Okay, see that? Mm -hmm. I'm going to go to chapter 3. See that? Chapter 4, you see in a pattern? Okay, let's go back now. <coughs> Second Nephi 15 correlates with Isaiah chapter 5. Second Nephi 14 with Isaiah chapter 4. Second Nephi 13 with Isaiah 3. Second Nephi 12 with Isaiah 2. And second and second Nephi 11 correlates with what? It doesn't. It doesn't. Why? Why would Nephi not include this? Let's go down. The vision of Isaiah concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Hezekiah. Okay, let's go to 2 Nephi 12 and Isaiah 2. 
the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning the same place in the last days. Last days. And at that time, the mountain of the Lord's house, which is what? The temple. The temple will be established where? In the mountains. In Utah. That's actually what Ute, Utah means, is the place or up on high, the top of the mountains. In Apache, it is Ye Utahi, which means the people up on high. And shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations, Gentiles would be the word. Do the Gentiles flow to Judah and Jerusalem of old? Never. They wouldn't even let him come to the temple. So what place ever in the history of Israel, i.e. the house of Israel, and what point in time have the Gentiles been allowed to flow to the temple in the top of the mountains? President Hinckley got up in 2000 and said this prophecy was fulfilled in Utah because out of Zion, the American continent, and Salt Lake City went forth the law and the word of the Lord from Utah and Salt Lake. So if we reread that, how do you pronounce that in Hebrew? Je is ye. Yehuda, Yehuda. How do you spell Utah for me? U T A H. Pronounce Utah. Utah. Okay, now break it down phonetically. Utah. How would you spell it phonetically? Oh, I don't know. Y U H. Y O O T A H. How would you say that in Hebrew? Utah. Yeah. yeah. Uda. Uda. <laughs> now, it's a, it's a good thing we Mormons are smart because we plan that, right? Mm -mm. <laughs> Who gave Utah its name? Anti Mormons from the U.S. government and Salt Lake City. We wanted Deseret. The anti Mormons gave us literally the Native American name for Judah. Now, that's just a coincidence, right? <laughs> and then President Hinckley says that prophecy is fulfilled. i got to show you one more thing now that I've said that. We'll come back to this one. There's an article published in 1958 in the National Geographic, National Geographic magazine called Geographical Twins, A World Apart. In that, they published photos of the... Jordan River in Israel and the Jordan River in Utah, the Dead Sea and the Great Salt Lake, and maps of Israel, the Dead Sea, Jerusalem, the Great Salt Lake, Salt Lake, Salt Lake City, Utah, 60 mile river called the Jordan River, and a fresh body of water called Utah Lake and the Sea of Galilee. Oh my goodness. It's 